nice to be with you and as I said it's a little intimidating with the quality of preachers that you've had here because um, I'm not a preacher I'm more a teacher and a local church pastor um, I wish that uh, some of you had been to Hillview Church and were youth at Hillview Church because you'd be sitting here in row two because this is where all the youth at Hillview sit in row two and row three on the left hand side of the church but obviously you like the back of the church that's where the youth in Bundaberg Church used to sit when I was a young person so yeah now I wonder if any of you know who the lady on the screen is today if any of you have a Greek Orthodox background you may know this person for it's only my Greek Orthodox friends who've been able to tell me who this person is when I've talked about her on some previous occasions. Now the topic that I'm going to talk about today is making disciples like Jesus. And that's an important thing because isn't that what Jesus has told us that we're responsible to do? Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the world. Well, we're going to use the illustration of Fertini, for this lady is Fertini. Do you know her? Have you heard about her before? And what can we learn from Jesus' encounter with Fertini that will help us as disciples of Jesus to make disciples like Jesus? Good question? Good reflection? That's where our journey will take us this afternoon. Do you know who Fatini is? Turn to your friend and say, I don't know who Fatini is. And then have another conversation with your neighbour and say, but at the end of this sermon, I will know who Fatini is. Because I'm going to preach as well as violin preachers, and you will say, great, I now know who Fotini is. Uh, I've deliberately chosen an ambiguous title for my talk this afternoon, the discussion that we have. What is ambiguous about my title? Making disciples like Jesus. Sophie. Is this good English or bad English or does it have the ability to be misunderstood? It does. So what could it mean? Making a disciple who looks like Jesus. How many of you thought that's what my title was about? Making disciples who look like Jesus looks, who live like Jesus looks, lived, who act like Jesus acted. How many thought that was the, the, the focus of my title? Any of you? Okay, tell me what the other option is for this ambiguous title for my sermon. No one's talking to me, you're not a talking group of people. Making disciples in the fashion that Jesus makes them. So making disciples the way that Jesus made disciples. How many of you thought that was what we were going to talk about this afternoon? Well, I deliberately chose an ambiguous thing because aren't both of these things important? If we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, then who should we be like? Jesus. Yes. And if we're going to make disciples for Jesus, how should we go about doing it? Obviously, the way that Jesus did it was the best way to do it. And as Jesus' disciples, we should act in the same way. So I deliberately chose an ambiguous title to get us thinking more broadly about the concept of making disciples for Jesus Christ. So what is a disciple? If we're going to make disciples like Jesus, what are we going to make? What does a disciple look like? If I were to ask you to give me some other words, modern words, words we might use more commonly in our English language today, what words would you give me for a disciple? Yes, student. a disciple is a student who learns from the teacher. the teacher. Thank you. 
Is there another word you might use instead of the word disciple to describe in our modern language? A follower. A disciple is a person who follows somebody else. So here we've got this relationship of the leader and the follower. There's another illustration of what a disciple could be if we're using modern language to describe them. Any other thoughts that come to your mind? Somebody said something which I didn't quite hear. A groupie. A groupie. Yes. What is a groupie? These are the fans who follow the musicians and they sit in the mosh pit and they jump up and down and get thrown up and down and, and, and do all sorts of other thought, naughty things we shouldn't talk about uh, in, uh, in church. But they do, don't they? That's what they are. Here's the, here's the, the, the star and I'm the groupie, the fan, who wants to be as close as I possibly can. Any other ones that you could have to describe what a disciple is? Okay, well, groupie wasn't one of the ones I had on my list, but thank you very much for reminding us that here's another illustration. Okay, we had leader follower, so thank you very much for that one. Teacher student. Thank you, that was one of the ones that we had. And sorry I won't be at your baptism tomorrow. I'm going to be visiting or trying to make disciples of some of my former uh, friends, well, some of my friends who used to worship regularly. So we've got an appointment to catch up with an old friend of ours who, who no longer comes and, uh, to church and, and we try and keep in touch and encourage him to rethink and his wife to rethink about faith in Jesus Christ. So that's my assignment for tomorrow morning. Enjoy the rain. I was thinking you'll be baptised twice, one by sprinkling and one by immersion. No, I'm English, I've got web page. Ah, okay, that's fine, that's fine. I had another one here, um, apprenticeship. How many people have done an apprenticeship? Uh, if you're in the professional world, then it's a traineeship, isn't it? You go and you're with somebody who is the master of doing this and you learn the trade. You learn how to make cabinet work. You learn how to do accounting. You learn how to be you know, whatever else it is, a lawyer. So here's this concept as well of master and apprentice. So the, the biblical term becoming a disciple or making a disciple, in fact, includes all of these concepts, including the concept of star and groupie or fan because there's that passion, excitement, enthusiasm, which is part of what a disciple is. But an all-embracing definition that we have chosen to use is this one. A disciple is a person who, in every way, is becoming more like Jesus Christ. So it's becoming, in every way, our life, our practice, the way we go about making disciples of other people, it is a reflection, it is an imitation of Jesus, his life, his ministry, and the way he went about making disciples. Who knows who Fotini is yet? No one's gone onto their phone and done a Google search? I thought a young church like this, that you would have already done that, or is there a rule in this church that in church, you don't do Google searches to find out what the preacher's talking about or to check if he's telling the truth. Okay, don't go then. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to help you. Um, no, no, before we do, let's talk about this for a minute. Disciples who look like Jesus. What did Jesus command you and me to be and become as we become disciples of Jesus Christ? And we've gone to two of the statements, two of the commands that Jesus gave to help paint a picture of what a disciple of Jesus will look like and how they will act. The first is the great command. Can you repeat that for me? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and you should Love your neighbour as yourself. 
So this is a command that's come from Jesus Christ, our master, our Lord, our, our teacher, uh, and he's the one that we should be following and, and imitating. So here's the first aspect of how a disciple who looks like Jesus will look. You also look at the Great Commission. What does the Great Commission say? Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have told you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. Let's think about that first one for a moment. What are the two characteristics of a disciple if we think about the great command? A disciple is a person who will love God with all their hearts, minds and souls. And a disciple is a person who will love others. So here are the two characteristics. To be like Jesus, we need to follow what Jesus said. Did he love God with all his heart, mind and soul? How do we know he loved God with all his heart, mind and soul? He gave his life in obedience to the Father's uh, instruction. How else do we know? He was a fan of the Father, wasn't he? How much time did Jesus spend with the Father? How many times did he go to the mountain to pray? And sometimes all night. Or early in the morning he was there. Remember what he said, I don't do anything, I only do what? The Father has told me to do and told me to say. He loved God with all his heart. Did he love other people? It seems to me that to look like Jesus looked, we need to worship God with all of our hearts and we need to minister to others as Jesus ministered to others. For loving God is an active thing. It's not just a word we speak. And loving our neighbour also is an active thing. It's something we do by ministering to others, both those who are in the fellowship of the church and also to those who are in the broader community. So here are two characteristics of what it means to look like Jesus. It means we worship God. It means we minister to others. Am I speaking slowly enough, Mrs Rice? Thank you. That wasn't her last instructions to the preacher. Speak slowly. Okay, the Great Commission. What are the characteristics of a follower of Jesus who is like Jesus? Go and make disciples. Is that something that Jesus did? In fact, he spent his whole life those three and a half years of ministry as his primary focus. And an interesting experience is to go through chronologically the life of Jesus and note the way in which he interacted with his disciples as he led them from that very first contact at the time of his baptism until the time about halfway through his ministry after he'd invited them to come and be with him for a little while to buy the lake and we're often confused because where does Jesus call his disciples? Which book, which chapter of Matthew is it? Which chapter of Mark is it? In Matthew, it's about chapter 7, I think. In, in Mark, it's about chapter 2. How far through Christ's ministry, those three and a half years, did this event take place? Year 1, year 2, or year 3? There's an assignment for the church. Go home and find out. At what point of time in Jesus' three and a half years of ministry did he call his disciples to become fishers of men? I won't tell you the answer, but that's a little assignment for personal study. So here we see in the Great Commission three things. A person who's like Jesus will be involved in the process of evangelizing the world. A person who is like Jesus will be a person who joins community. For when Jesus said, be baptised in whom to who? The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're already entering into community with the Godhead. But when you're baptised, you're also baptised, baptised into the community of faith. You become part of the family. Or as Paul says, we are adopted into the family of God. So a person who looks like Jesus will be involved in community. And finally, Jesus said in that Great Commission, 
we are to become like him. And part of the process of making disciples, Jesus said, is to teach people to obey everything that I have commanded you. So there's a little picture of what a disciple looks like from the great commandment, worshipping God and ministering to others, and from the great commission, evangelising the world, joining community and becoming Christ-like. But now I want to go back and look at the other part of this ambiguous title to my sermon. How did Jesus make disciples? And if we're going to make disciples the way Jesus made disciples, then what do we have to do as followers of Jesus to make disciples? Do you want to find out the answer? But before we do, let's see if we can discover who Fotini is. I'm going to give you some clues. I want you to stand up as soon as you think you have the right answer, okay? She is only mentioned once in the Bible. Does that help anyone? No one wants to stand up and say, I think I've got the answer. Okay, let me give you another clue. John does not name her. That's hardly a clue, isn't it? Because you know that Fatini isn't a name in the Bible. So, but you also now know from this clue that her story is where? In the Gospels, in the book of John. Anyone wants to suggest who it is? Yes. She was the Samaritan woman. She was the Samaritan woman. Thank you. Can you give that man a prize? I didn't bring one. I'm sorry. Okay, this might have helped some of the rest of you. Only three days of her life was recorded. Day one, she meets with Jesus. Day two and three, the whole village is together as Jesus nurtures them and grows them before he continues on his journey to Galilee. That might have helped some others. This one probably wouldn't have helped any of you. Did you know that Fatini, the woman at the well, died as a martyr for her faith? It's not in the Bible, but it's in Christian history. And this is where her name comes from, from early church history. Her name was Fatini. And Fatini is a Greek word which means photo. Photogenesis, it means light. Fatini, the light. And when you think about the way in which Jesus brought living water to her and how her life light up, lit up, and how she then went back to the village and the village lit up with the story of Jesus. So there is Fatini, and she is the woman at the well. Turn to your friend and say, I now know who Fatini is. She's the woman at the well. Is church supposed to be educational, Tim? It is supposed to be educational. How many have passed the test now? Who knows who Fatini is? She is the woman at the well. You can all go to the top of the class. Okay, well, let's look at her story in John chapter 4. If you have a Bible, take it and come to John chapter 4. This is towards the end of the Bible. If you don't know where it is, it's easy to find. If you've got a smartphone, just go to your Bible app and find it. And we're going to do a little bit of interactive stuff here this afternoon as we begin to explore the story of Fatini in a way that helps us to understand the way in which Jesus made disciples and to see if in that understanding can help us to copy the example of Jesus, the way Jesus went about making disciples. It's actually quite a long story. It goes for most of the chapter. I'm going to try and tell it to you or read it to you. Highlighting parts, and then I'm going to give you an assignment. You are allowed to talk in church. I give you permission. He had to go, verse 4 says, through Samaria on the way to Galilee. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sica near the field of Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long work, sat wearily beside the well about noontide. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at this time because the disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Down to verse 9. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. 
She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift of God, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope, and you don't have a bucket, and this well is very deep. Where would you get living water? And besides, do you think that you are greater than our father uh, Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes fresh, bubbling, spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come to this well to draw water again. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Uh, I, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. You're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and you aren't married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it to be here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it's no longer matter where you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, and indeed already is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything. Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Here's your assignment. You need to turn into a little group as best you can, one or two or three or four. And I want one person in the group to retell that story in modern language. Okay? I want to hear some talking. If you only two, but some of you can turn to the person behind and that'll form a little group of three just by the middle gap. Form into a little group in the middle there. You're going to be talking to each other and one of you in the group is going to tell the others this story in, your, in modern language. Jesus decided that he needed to walk from fountain in the city to observatory hill. Okay, two minutes to retell the story. Go for it. I would like to hear what you had said, but we don't have time for you each to tell the story to me. So I hope you've got it clearly in your mind because here is the next three questions you need to discuss. You know this story, you've heard it for a long time, but what does the Bible say? The Word of God is quick and powerful. It is a living Word. And God's Spirit is alive today. So as you think about these three questions, there may well be some new insights, some new understanding, something that surprises you about this passage as the Spirit of God guides your discussion now. So ask yourselves these questions and talk about it. What new insight, what's new in this story as we think about it this afternoon? What in this story surprises you today? Is there some part of this story that you don't understand? So they're the three questions I want you to discuss in your little groups for the next five minutes. And I'm going to interrupt you again. 
Okay, I want you now to talk to me. Who discovered something new in this passage as you looked at it this afternoon? Something that the Spirit of God said, wow, I've not seen it that way before. Talk to me. Anybody with something new, a new insight from this passage this afternoon? Yes. Yep. Good. Hmm. And she was a bit like, why am I getting new things? You should be getting new things. So I just did the expectation. <laughs> yep, the insight. Creating this expectation. Jesus created this expectation on the part of the woman that she perceived him to be a holy person, so a spiritual person. Yeah, yeah. Okay, someone else as they went through this passage and talked about it, something new that you hadn't seen there before, something new in sight. Anything that surprised anybody from the discussion as you looked at this story? Yes? Mm-hmm. Whatever. The engine's not working, so I'm not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. So suddenly, a man come from nowhere, approach me, mm-hmm. behind me. So I turn around, and then he was asking me, and I was asking him, who are you? And he said, well, I'm looking for someone. As I can see, we have a car. I'm looking for someone to help me to get to my destiny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am waiting for someone to help me to get to my destiny also. So, you know, after that we come they have conversation together. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just brings back the example I said, because you don't know who, I, who you are talking to. Mm-hmm. She did not know who she talking to that man. Mm-hmm. The man said, how would you know if your car will not be working here? Mm-hmm. And then she said, "Well, I'm waiting for someone to help me." So you know, this is this is the the link to this. Mm-hmm. Makes me think about this here being a divine appointment, and God often provides those in our lives if we're open to them and take the opportunities to share. Mm-hmm. Yep. Amazing, isn't it? Anyone else who found something surprising as they looked at this passage of scripture today? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Slapped his face. Slapped her Yes. 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 Yeah, I often think about that little passage of scripture myself and I still don't have an answer to it. How did Jesus say, go and call your husband? As this conversation was progressing and she says, you know, why are you a man talking to me, a woman? And that conversation progresses a little little way down the track. Is Jesus in some very appropriate way saying, well, you know, you and I have been talking together and we shouldn't be talking because you're a woman and I'm a man. You know, go and get your husband so we can continue this conversation. Was it one of those sort of things? Or was it a more accusing thing? Go and get your husband. Um, I don't have a husband. Um, So, yeah, we don't know just the, the situation from it. I tend to think because Jesus, being who he was, was always that gentle, encouraging, um, yeah, probing. Um, so we don't know. We don't know. But it does sort of 
seem to come out of the blue a little bit, the record of it. He's having one conversation and suddenly moves to bring your husband here. I, I think it's the, as I've described it, but you know, we don't know. We don't know the circumstances. Okay, uh, what have we learnt then about Jesus' approach to making disciples? And here's my little summary from uh, Jesus' method with the woman at the well. This passage starts with Jesus saying he had to go through Samaria. Did he? We understand that the more common route for Jewish people was not to travel through Samaria, this foreign land, up through the mountains and up over the, the wilderness area, but to go down to, 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 to Jericho and travel up along the lush green Jordan River. Where was he going to? He was going to Galilee. But the geography up and down over the hills. But he said, I have to go through Samaria. He was going to places where lost people were. And it seems to me that with prayer guiding the life of Jesus, he had prayed about this journey. And the Father was guiding him. Point number one, Jesus goes where lost people are. Jesus takes the first step to engage this lady in conversation. Takes the first step to engage the lady in conversation. What do you do? Could easily just stay sitting at the well, let the lady come, get her water, put a water bowl on her head, go back into the village. But what does he do? He takes the initiative to start the conversation. How many of you are comfortable doing this and how many of you are not so comfortable about starting conversations? Those who are comfortable, put your hands up. I expect all those who are um, sanguines will put their hand up and start conversations as easy as anything. Those of you who are more uh, introverted, who finds it hard to start a conversation with somebody? Yeah, That's the reality, isn't it? Should we only do the things that we're comfortable with or should we be asking God, give me the courage when I'm too scared to do it? Not easy. Uh, in fact, um, I prefer to preach than what I do to start a conversation with a stranger in the street. And yet I'm praying to God, God, give me the right words. Help me to be bold enough. Uh, you asked me where I've been recently. Well, I've just come back on um, Friday last week, 10 days ago, from the Cook Islands where I was out doing some training with Sabbath School and Disciple Making, how we use Sabbath School as an effective tool. And uh, we had one day when we had nothing on, so we chose to do a lagoon cruise. And there's a small boat. There were about nine or ten of us there. And uh, a small group like that, you become, you know, connect with each other quite well. Uh, one of the couples who were on the boat were from Switzerland. So partway through the, the, the day, I went and sat in front of them and began to talk with them because a couple of years ago, Barb and I were in Switzerland when I'd gone across to present some... Uh, some, a report on some work we'd done in Papua New Guinea with uh, health initiatives for the community. So I asked them where they were from and, and so on. And they asked me why I was over there and I explained that I was, you know, with the church and we'd done some good stuff in Papua New Guinea on health education. Um, and I could have just left at that, but then it seemed to me that I needed to have a conversation a little bit further. So I asked the question of them, what connection do you have with the church? And I expected their answer to be nothing. Where do they come from? They come from Switzerland. How many people go to church in Switzerland? It may be the root of our Protestant Reformation. It may be where John Calvin came from and so on, but the percentages are about the same as in Australia with about 7 or 8% of the population going to church regularly. So I wasn't surprised. Um, it was just an opportunity to raise their awareness again and, and continue that conversation and say, yeah, that's what's happened. It's our parents and the people in the rural areas that you know, tend to still have some connection with Christ, you know, with the church. But sometimes when life isn't going well, we sometimes think, is there somebody up there who can help us in that situation? A seed sown, because what does the Bible say? One person sows, 
another person waters. It's God's spirit who grows the disciple of Jesus Christ. So yes, I need to pray for boldness to have those sort of conversations as those of the rest of you who are introverted people need to pray for boldness as well. But also wisdom to know what to say at the right time. And God promises, doesn't he, that he will give us the words to speak. So he takes the first step. He starts where the person is. What did Jesus start talking about? Water. Water. What was on the lady's mind? Water. Makes sense, doesn't it? Start where people are. And then use what? The ordinary as an opportunity to connect with the spiritual. And you see Jesus doing that very, very well. He meets the spiritual longing with God answers. So in this conversation, he moves from the water, he connects with her deep longing for satisfaction and fulfillment and says, the answer to you is not water from this well. The answer to your problems is a God answer. The Spirit of God awakening within you and you being led to worship in spirit and in truth. So the spiritual longings are answered with God answers. We stop the story before we come to this point, but notice what happens. Jesus immediately engages the woman as a disciple maker. Didn't send her off to summer school to do a course. Didn't send her to, in, to inspire to do a, a three-month training program on how to share your faith. Immediately challenged her to share what she had with somebody else. Go and tell your husband. Immediately. In fact, one of the principles that we're trying to highlight as we think about this cycle of preparing the soil, of sowing the seed of the gospel into someone's life, of cultivating that plant, of harvesting that plant and multiplying the whole process, is that right from step one, you engage the people that you're preparing the soil of to help them to prepare the soil in someone else. So you get involved in some community project, a soup kitchen, and you help someone in that situation. Do you just keep on helping them? No, as soon as you can, you say, hey, why don't you come on this side of the desk and help me serve food to the other people who have a need? Immediately moving the person where they are into that process of becoming more like Jesus and serving others, not just being the recipient of our kindness to the community. How does the story go on? Well, the woman goes back to the village and says to who? Her husband, I guess, first off. And who else? Think about this lady for a moment. How many times has she been married? Five. How many mother-in-laws does she have? <laughs> How many father-in-laws does she have? How many brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws? We don't know the answer to all these things, but just let your imagination wander. Here's a lady who's been married five times. And she has this amazing network of all these former relatives. And she goes back to the village and says, Hey, there's this guy out there. He must be a prophet. He's just told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? And all her mother-in-laws, father-in-laws, brother-in-laws, sister-in-laws, nieces, nephews, cousins, come out to see what the lady is talking about. Um, the story goes on, you know, that they beg for Jesus to stay and teach them. He says, well, I can't stay here for too long, but how long does he stay? Three days, I told you at the beginning. We only know three days of this woman's life from scriptures. And during those three days, he uh, cultivated and nurtured uh, and, and solidified that faith that had been built in the woman and in the community. 
That was how Jesus made disciples. He goes to where lost people are. He takes the first step to connect. He starts with where the person is. He takes the ordinary and connects it to the spiritual. He meets those spiritual needs with God answers and immediately engages the person in the process of making more disciples. So how well are you doing in making disciples like Jesus made disciples? Okay, well, I want you to retell the story. It was where we started. We had this discussion. What is new? What surprises you in the story? What don't you understand? But there's really two more questions that you need to think about as we finish. Question number one. What command or principle do you need to apply to yourself? So what in that story is a command or a principle that I need to say as a disciple of Jesus, this is what I need to do from today onwards. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts because it's only you who can make the word of God alive to us and convict us and give us the courage to say, yes, I will make disciples like Jesus made disciples. Just going to give you 30 seconds in silence to let the Spirit of God highlight for you what he wants you to do differently or more of as a result of the story of Fatini. I hope that the Spirit of God has said to some of you at least that you need to spend more time with people who are lost people. Okay, who are you going to tell? I hope that some of you will go to your friends who aren't believing people and say to them, at church, At Fountain in the City on Saturday afternoon, (coughs) the preacher didn't preach and he wasn't as good as Byron or as Asterix or as Gary. But as we were there together, he told me that we should spend more time with people who are not believers. And so, John, I've decided that you and I are going to get together every week for coffee for the next month. Because that's what the preacher said we should be doing. Well, did the preacher say that? No, I hope it's the Spirit of God that says that. But tell what you've discovered to somebody else during this week. So there's the story and the final two questions relating to John chapter 4. So my questions, my title was deliberately ambiguous. I want you to be a disciple who looks like Jesus. And I want you to make disciples the way Jesus made disciples. How are you doing at growing like Jesus? To the first one. Are you worshipping with all all your heart? Are you ministering to others? Are you evangelising? Are you becoming a bigger part of community and being community to other people? Are you becoming more Christ-like? And are you following Jesus' way of connecting with lost people? That's the challenge of Fatimi's story. The good news is that God's Spirit will help you this week to grow more like Jesus and also to make disciples the way that Jesus made disciples. As the ladies, oh well, as the people come and sing us some special music, I'm just jumping to conclusions, it's ladies. As the group comes and sings to us, as somebody comes and sings to us, someone's going to sing? I want you to think about this 
question here, how am I doing? How am I growing? It's not a group, it's just one person. It's just me. Just <laughs> you. Thank you. Well, I won't try and sing with you. been faithful to us and thank you that that's the good news that we have to share with the world that is lost from your grace that you are a God who will always be faithful to them help us to connect with those people who are lost from your grace so that we can speak into their hearts and their minds the way Jesus did that there is life there is a faithful God will provide living water that will bubble up within and flow into the lives of others. Thank you for that grace that has touched our hearts and we commit ourselves to be involved with the lives of lost people 
and share with them the good news of a faithful God. As we go from this time of worship, we know that you will continue to be with us. And as we leave this building, the church will go into the, into the heart of Sydney to be the church Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday as we interact with people. May your blessing rest upon each one of us in Jesus' name.